Hello and welcome to Replay Value. When I think of Code Geass, I think of Jibun Wo, which I almost can't say without singing, an alternate history that I wish more material would explore, several fascinating characters, Matter Sky, and an incredibly satisfying conclusion to one of my favorite anime ever. But that's because I love Code Geass, in spite of its flaws, from its treatment of chess, the soft reset in season 2 to force back the school setting, the second OP, the unprompted fan service. But none of those issues that I have are as widely divisive as the scene referenced in the title of this video. One that is so memorable that people who have seen it know exactly what I'm talking about just by mentioning the one character's name. And there's a pretty good chance that even if you've only heard of Code Geass, this sequence is so ubiquitous in criticism of it that you would likely be able to intuit what I meant by the Euphemia moment. Because this scene, for better or worse, is a part of Code Geass's lasting legacy, the moment the show allegedly jumped the shark and one that I'll be taking it upon myself to defend here. I'll also be outlining why I think this sequence got a bad rap and arguably still deserves it, in addition to all the usual scene analysis, bells and whistles, so that everyone is refreshed as to the major elements at play in this scene. Bloodstained Yuffie is one of the last episodes in Season 1 and serves as the point of no return prior to the climax. Over the previous few episodes of the show, Princess Euphemia has gone through quite the emotional journey confirming that her half-brother Lelouch is not only in fact not dead, but also Zero, the leader of the rebellion helping the Japanese fight against the Britannian occupation. Lelouch even went so far as to kill their half-sibling Clovis, who was the previous viceroy of what is called Area 11. Yuffie has also fallen in love with nightmare pilot Suzaku, a soldier for the Britannian army who is viewed as a traitor by some of the Japanese civilians, as he is also Japanese, yet fighting for their occupiers. And Yuffie discovers that Lelouch's sister, Nunnally, is alive as well. All of these factors together cause her to proclaim as sub-viceroy of Area 11 that she'll be creating the Special Administrative Zone of Japan, effectively a Japanese state with oversight by Britannia. Which she does because of her desire to be with all the people she cares about, but is also directly opposed to Lelouch's desires to have Area 11 rebel against his father, the Emperor of Britannia. The episode opens with both sides discussing the SAZ, setting up the fact that this could be a death knell to the Black Knights, Zero's military unit, and true Japanese independence, since presumably rebellion would stop. It's viewed negatively on both sides of the conflict, with even Britannian nobles attacking Japanese commoners for trying to drum up support for the cause. In a familiar sight, we see Lelouch stand up for the weak against the strong, but as he begins to use his gios, the power to command someone to do any act, he cuts himself off by closing his eye. This scene has two interpretations, one that he stopped himself because his friend would have also made eye contact as the command was made, or that his gios began to appear unintentionally and he realized before he said something he didn't mean, in this case, telling the man to kill himself. This concept of gios going out of control had been foreshadowed in a previous encounter with Mao, another user whose power to read minds developed to the point where it could never be turned off and led to the worst possible tragedy for him being abandoned by C2. As Lelouch meets privately with Euphemia at the ceremony to announce the SAZ, he tells her of his plan to be shot by her and continue his rebellion with public support. At that moment though, his Gios acts up, causing both him and C2 to fall to the floor in pain, though only C2 is aware of what's happening, as she says, he's reached that point, and Euphemia is only able to convince Lelouch not to go through with his plan because she's being considerate of Nunnally. She's giving up her claim to the throne because she truly desires this outcome. An opportunity to be with Lelouch, Nunnally, and Suzaku without anyone having to fight anymore. Even as Lelouch continues to try and bait the pure Yuffie into saying something that will give him cause to continue his plan, she's just entirely honest about her feelings and her desires, not wanting to lose anyone important to her, which of course includes him. As Lelouch declares her win, a calming vocal track begins to replace the more confrontational music to confirm the peaceful aftermath. At this point, there's no more tension in the scene. Lelouch is no longer holding a gun. It's just two siblings chatting comfortably, probably made most clear when Euphemia questions his certainty that she'd shoot him if he so demanded. Lelouch begins to explain his power that he could command her to do anything, a claim so ridiculous that Euphemia can't help but exclaim, <laughs> Where 
where the music suddenly cuts, and Euphemia, who struggles against the command for a moment, succumbs to Gias and does in fact begin the process of massacring the entire Japanese population at the ceremony. It's a tragedy of epic proportions, both in how it affects the world at large and how it affects our principal cast. Loss of life and a farewell to any semblance of a happy ending. What I really appreciate about the sequence though, despite the obvious stuff like the dramatic nature of Lelouch battling against the straightforward Euphemia, I wonder if their outfit colors have anything to do with their moral alignment, is how the moment-to-moment -moment visuals play into the critical beats. Notably in the command, we never see Lelouch activate his power. Using Gias follows a three-part visual structure. First, command and close-up of Lelouch's eye, followed by zooming into the target's eye, and finally visualization of the Gias shifting brainwaves or something along those lines. In this case, we skip the first one of those entirely, not even the usual sound effect, plays in that scene, instead using this far shot that makes both characters small in the frame. It's supposed to be a total undercut of the viewer's expectations, as much a shock to them as it is to Lelouch. A betrayal of his powers at the worst possible moment. And not to jump too far past this moment, but this immediately builds into the climax of season 1, the attack on Tokyo. With emotions running so high because of the events of Bloodstained Yuffie. Suzaku heartbroken looking for vengeance, a guilty but determined Lelouch. The finale of season 1 is amped up to 11 because of the Euphemia moment. So, with the recap done, what are the exact elements that cause grievance and that I'll be attempting to defend? Unsurprisingly, they're all based around the statement, kill all of the Japanese, which is argued to be a Diabolus ex Mahina, an unexpected event that suddenly ruins everything for the protagonist, the opposite of a Deus ex Mahina. There's the fact that Lelouch says those words in the first place, the idea that the Gias activation came out of nowhere, and the timing on that activation to occur at that very moment. The second one of those I think I've already put to bed. It had been foreshadowed not just by Mao in the previous arc, but twice in this very episode. I have what I think is a convincing argument for Lelouch's statement, but the timing window... Well, let's detour really quickly. Because this is such a divisive topic, I want to quickly overtly state that I understand why people don't like this scene, and why I think anyone would be justified in not finding my upcoming conclusions satisfying. I don't think this is like the Hyoka finale where most of the detractors believe it to be unsatisfying because they're missing the subtext. That is not the case here. I think there is a legitimate complaint about the timing of Lelouch's Gios becoming permanent to be contrived in its writing. That the show had painted itself into a corner with Euphemia's personality, political beliefs, and relationship with Lelouch, such that Lelouch had no choice but to accept her terms and end the core dramatic thread that defined the show. He admits as much in that very conversation, and it is only by the grace of the screenwriter that this ending is stalled and the show continues without making Lelouch kill an innocent character without just cause. I don't think people are wrong for not liking that. Of course, most if not all fiction writing is convenient in some way. New conversations open with contextual material so the unknowing audience is clued into the discussion and character names. The start of the story coincides with the inciting incident and not the majority of the protagonist's irrelevant childhood. We don't watch characters slowly and silently eat all their meals. But those aren't massive plot points that define their stories. It's easy to nitpick convenience in writing, but it tends to be bad faith criticism about stuff done for the audience's benefit or story pacing, and that undermines actual complaints with elements that legitimately strain the audience's suspension of disbelief. The Euphemia moment isn't something insubstantial, it is the climax of the story to that point and has massive ramifications for the entire plot and almost every character. The audience has to accept that Lelouch's Gios went crazy at this exact moment, and he made eye contact just as he made that statement instead of the previous ones. That's a pretty convenient timing window. So I'm not here to tell you that this sequence is handled perfectly. If it was, this video wouldn't exist because no one would be complaining, and my argument regarding the timing window is not that it's perfect and that you're crazy for being bothered by it. Suspension of disbelief varies between watchers, so if Code Geass hasn't captured your imagination at this point in the show, I can totally see why this would bother you instead of shocking you, as I'm led to believe was the intent by the shot selection and the timing of the sequence. Brief tangent though, 
I do wonder why you stuck around to the Euphemia moment. I don't know how no one seeing Arthur wearing Zero's mask when everyone in the school was chasing him wasn't the capstone moment of implausibility. Though the tone of that sequence was clearly comedic, so it doesn't carry the same weight. Still though, I mean, come on, it was pretty ridiculous. My defense of the Euphemia moment is not an attempt to convince you that the linchpin sequence is not convenient in its timing. That's an unfortunate side effect of trying to unite Lelouch and the audience in their shock about the event. But rather, that Lelouch's statement is not all that outlandish when you consider his character, and that even if you do believe the Gios activation moment to be a Diabolus Ex Mahina because of the timing, it is thematically consistent with the story. In my chess video, I referenced the Euphemia moment's tendency to be discussed as Lelouch's poorly timed joke, but I don't think that's a fair description because I wouldn't describe Lelouch's statement as a joke. Lelouch means everything he's saying to Euphemia in this scene. If anything, he's being more honest with her than literally anyone not named C2, and there's two reasons for that. For starters, he's let his guard down. He's with someone he trusts and who cares about his most important person, Nunnally. Nothing he does from this point on is a tough decision. The tough decision was agreeing to work with Euphemia. After that, there's nothing to worry about. His scheming has come to an end, and his time as Zero, the master of rebellion, is over. Lelouch is surrendering, and that's the other part. Lelouch is a walking incarnation of pride. It has been shown over and over again how he thrives on outsmarting people, laughing hysterically whenever someone walks into one of his traps, his showmanship in the rescue of Suzaku. Hell, Cornelia makes an amazing read on Zero and says that he's prideful, presumably based on his tactics. That's borne out by the fact that Lelouch never thinks he's going to be defeated. He usually has the one singular strategy for that encounter, and he's insanely confident in his abilities. Justifiably so, by the way. When he is defeated, like against Cornelia in that same fight, he complains about the unequal playing field to which C2 rightfully calls him a sore loser. Lelouch is a proud guy. He doesn't like admitting defeat, and so when he's surrendering to Euphemia, he's doing the classic, I could have won if I wanted to. That's totally in character, and when Euphemia says, you're just being silly to his assertion that he could win, it's all the more reason for him to double down and state the thing that is the most abhorrent to her as if to prove he could do it. The thing that he would do if not for the fact that he cares about her. The other thing is that because Lelouch's guard is down, he's not being cautious. And I'd actually argue that Lelouch is not a particularly cautious guy to begin with. Arthur running off with his zero mask being a one example on that list, and his cavalier attitude towards his Gios as a get out of jail free card that almost winds up biting him in the ass against Cornelia as A2. But especially because he thinks his fight is over, it's unlikely he'd be considering Mao's permanent Gios affliction as he's having this conversation. Again, maybe another example of his pride. So I think Lelouch is consistent as a character in this scene. He's not the kind of guy to be focused on the worst case scenario and is absolutely 1000% the kind of guy who, if you beat him in something, would start talking about how he had a brilliant plan that he could have used if he wanted to win. Him saying something so outlandish to exaggerate his point seems only natural for a proud guy like Lelouch. But the character flaw that leads to his statement is only one part because his Gios needs to activate in order for anything to happen. That, I believe, is best explored by taking a look at what exactly Code Gios is cribbing from in its dramatic ideas. Part of the Diabolus Ex Mahina moment being consistent with the thematic nature of the story is a reminder of what kind of drama Code Gios is in its DNA. Code Gios is a tragedy, or at the very least, it likely fancies itself one of the Shakespearean variety, this is best shown in the first episode when Lelouch is reading none other than Hamlet. Lelouch is a disowned prince in a monarchy filled with fratricide, revenge, betrayal both by family and advisors, power vacuums and zealous overthrows bringing to mind Macbeth, King Lear, and the aforementioned Danish prince. Lelouch and Hamlet both are driven by revenge and achieve it, kill their first loves incidentally, kill the kings of their countries, and their storylines end with a death confession scene where they tell their one friend who knows the whole story to live on. I wouldn't go so far as to claim that Code Geass is a sci-fi spin on Shakespeare, but certainly Code Geass is at the very least aware of that tradition. Ex Mahina moments are not infrequent in Shakespeare's works, like the ending of Romeo and Juliet, where the message of her plan to take a potion that will make her seem dead just happens to be delayed and, in a moment of story convenience, 
Juliet doesn't awaken in time to stop Romeo from killing himself, but wakes up immediately after and kills herself before anyone can find her. They are frequently used, like in the previous example, to create the tragedy from what would otherwise be a happy, triumphant moment, especially when the characters do not deserve it for their previous actions, especially when it comes to the killing of others. And that's basically what's happening here. Lelouch is not allowed to achieve happiness because he has caused so much destruction to this point. Another tragic element at play, though not Shakespearean, is the Faustian bargain Lelouch makes with C2 for the power of kings, which she notes will isolate him. Something borne out by Zero Requiem, which is the ending of season 2, and which of course winds up being the vehicle for the Diabolus Ex Machina, the double-edged sword that both brought him to this moment and will now be ripping it away. This sequence reinforces the idea of Gios being a curse beyond just C2 saying so. Sure, we saw what happened to Mao when his Gios became permanent. He lost his mind in C2, which certainly falls under tragedy for that character, but he was an antagonist. The only real downside to Gios for Lelouch to this point is that he wiped Shirley's memories, but that's just fallout from non gios related actions. Everything else has been coming up rainbows. This aspect of Gios's curse hits a lot closer to home because it's our protagonist who is burnt directly because of Gios. And it kills a character who the audience has gotten to know and appreciate, if not outright like, quite a bit. Because it is Lelouch's pride that leads him to say the words, the tragic element is in full effect. If not for this character flaw of needing to win, Lelouch, Euphemia, and everyone else would be happy instead of the insane brutality of both the massacre and the following attack on Tokyo. It is only by the gift of his Gios that Lelouch is on the verge of such happiness, and it is a curse that destroys said happiness and punishes him for his pride. It's fate dealing just desserts after killing his half-brother, hundreds of others, declaring that he would walk the path of blood and then choosing instead to retreat from that chosen destiny. On top of that, it immediately forces Lelouch to realize that he's just a faker when he speaks about being a messiah for the Japanese people. Going from declaring himself their true savior as opposed to Euphemia in his rage, and then after condemning the innocents to their deaths, has to reckon with his own self-image crumbling. It would seem that at the very least some part of Lelouch wanted this, the opportunity to play hero. Otherwise his grandstanding with Euphemia was completely farcical. And it is all the more tragic that fate granted him his wish in the worst possible way. This concept of fate having a direct hand in the Gyas' activation even gets a feasible in-universe explanation with C's world and all the mystical elements that don't get proper explanation in Season 1. But for the purposes of this discussion, that's not relevant to the viewer's initial interpretation of the sequence since that material is only made clear in the second season and could arguably be a retroactive explanation on the part of the creators. Again, I'm not arguing that the timing window isn't convenient, but even if you consider the sequence to be a Diabolus Ex Machina, that's right in alignment with the story's dramatic intent. And the shock factor that unifies the audience with the horror of Gios is designed to make us question whether it really is a blessing or a curse, and raise questions about the kind of person Lelouch really is. A moment of reflection for himself in that regard as well. So, acknowledging that the timing window is this critical element that serves to create shock value in the scene, I have a thought experiment I'd like us to consider. Imagine an alternate world where the Euphemia moment is played for suspense instead. So once both characters collapse for the Gios' maturation, instead of C2 saying the more vague, he's reached that point, she says explicitly, his Gios is permanent now. And when we cut back to Lelouch, his eye is red for the rest of the scene, ready to send off a command even though he's clearly unaware of it. For the viewer, the remainder of the conversation is just a question of when Lelouch will utter a command without realizing it and how bad will the consequences be. It's a ticking time bomb in the background of the episode that creates tension, even as the conversation on the face should be undercutting that since it's a moment of surrender and togetherness for the two on screen. It's very much a touch of evil Hitchcock way to play the scene, and personally it's more my taste anyway. The question I have is, if you think that the original's timing window is too contrived, does this alleviate that for you? making the audience aware of what's going to happen prior to the command, instead of unifying with Lelouch's shock when Yuffie collapses fighting against Gios. Nothing would even have to change from that point on in the sequence. We'd have to fix some of the music in that scene, but it's just a small tweak to change the viewer's engagement with that sequence. 
And it might also do away with the viewpoint that the final moment is too convenient. I doubt it fixes all of the issues that anyone could have with this sequence, especially for those that felt a strong emotional attachment to Euphemia, but personally I think I'd really enjoy the sequence being played that way, and I have a feeling I'm not alone. So after that lengthy defense and thought experiment, here are my major issues with the Euphemia moment, because while I don't have the same problems that I just defended it from, I do have some legitimate complaints. The Euphemia moment doesn't actually wind up changing Lelouch's character by a significant degree. Sure, it completely upends Cornelia, Nina, and of course Suzaku, but for our protagonist, the second season's memory wipe also seems to undo any of the lessons that should be learned. He killed the first girl he ever loved, and it was all his fault! Yet it seems like Euphemia's passing becomes more Suzaku's character arc than it does any part of Lelouch's. It does wind up being motivation for Zero Requiem, the parallels in the second season regarding Nunnally's SAZ are super fascinating, Suzaku fleeing Tokyo because of Gias in another parallel is thematic gold, but I cannot help but feel like its impact on Lelouch's character is limited to the moments between his Gias firing and then his gun firing. It just seems odd that it has so little impact on his character because Lelouch is so busy at the start of the next season trying to reestablish the Black Knights and everything else, there's no time for contemplation because we have to get back to the norms. My other issue is similar. The show should have hard committed to the idea that Lelouch now has to be particular about his words when he's not wearing the Zero Mask. But he gets a workaround to make the Gios no longer effectively permanent. The contact lens he can put on and remove to control it just like before. This is the definition of a narrative cop-out and it's personally the reason I have the most issue with the decision to make it permanent at all. It only comes into effect this one time. It would seem like this is also a fault of the soft reset in season 2. And it's infuriating to me how the Euphemia moment's consequences on Lelouch's character are basically null in the moment to moment goings on of the second season outside of a few select scenes. Almost all of my complaints about the structure of Code Geass can be traced to the second season, but hey, that might be a video for another time, which in turn brings us to the end of this video. Were you persuaded at all by my defense? Does my alternate take on the Euphemia moment sound more appealing? Will it take me six months before I take a look at the Akito films as the next video in my Code Geass franchise list? Hopefully not, but regardless, thanks for watching. Thank you for your patience while I finish this one up, and catch y'all with another video real soon.